Okay, uh, so this is ancient Rome uh, at Flagler College, I'm Dr. Young. Um, the information uh, specifically about individual politicians from this point on uh, for the next several lectures is going to come rather fast and furious. Um, this is the one point in the semester where, or the term I should say, where we will get somewhat bogged down in talking about individuals. Um, this is because the sources lead us in this direction. This is not because there, are, you know, there were, were, was a lack of other things going on in Rome. Um, but the drama of the last century of the Republic's existence is really good stuff. Um, if you like, uh, you know, intrigue and murder and, and uh, all the, you know, a lot of the things that make for a good story, um, uh, political maneuvering, um, courtroom drama, um, I mean, we could go on and on. Uh, it has the makings of, you know, uh, a great TV series, and in fact, um, there have been many attempts to do this, either in TV or in film, some more successful than others. Um, I, I realize this will, you know, this the, the number of names here can get a little overwhelming. I'll try to keep it... Um, as simple as possible and let you work out some of the uh, details in reading the Watts book and reading the Africa book and, you know, reading some of the primary sources about this stuff. So uh, we'll start in the 130s BCE, um, where we see some serious attempts to reform uh, the Roman political system to try to deal with some of the problems uh, of expansion that we talked about in the last uh, video lecture. And uh, these events in the 130s and 120s um, were in part uh, spurred by some things that happened uh, toward the beginning of the 130s. Uh, we mentioned, we've mentioned already these wars in Iberia um, that Rome had for a, a more than, little more than a half century, been um, trying to cow the uh, uh, peoples of Spain into submission. Um, and uh, this bred a great deal of resentment among the peoples of Spain. Um, and uh, it also uh, led to a lot of discontent within Rome itself because in order to prosecute those wars, um, the uh, politicians who, who wanted the prestige that would come from winning battles uh, on foreign soil um, had to uh, uh, draft um, Roman citizens into service, and, and uh, this was really getting old for a lot of people, right? And so there was a lot of discontent and even protest and rioting in Rome um, uh, against the conscription uh, of soldiers. Um, there was in Spain itself a slave revolt um, that uh, was disastrous in the short term for uh, for Rome. It was led by a guy named Eunus, um, and... Uh, he actually proclaimed himself um, a kind of king, uh, and uh, I think he called himself King Antiochus or something like that after the uh, Seleucid rulers. Um, and they, you know, the, these slaves seized uh, quite a number of towns, um, and this uh, led. Um, uh, th this was eventually suppressed, but. Um, uh, this w would set a pattern for later slave revolts, um, especially the slave revolt in the 70s BCE, led by a guy named Spartacus. Um, uh, I should mention, one thing that I, I passed over here that I, I should have mentioned is that the, the Romans had suffered some defeats in Iberia. And the career of the guy we want to talk about now was in part shaped by this. Um, and so I'll... I'll talk about that uh, in the course of the discussion of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. Tiberius Gracchus was um, from one of the most prestigious uh, hereditary lines, I should say two of the most prestigious hereditary lines in Rome. Uh, on his father's side, um, he came from arguably the most uh, noble, wealthy, and um, honorable of all of the plebeian families, uh, the Sempronii Gracchi. Uh, they had you know, served in high positions in Roman politics for many generations. They were not patrician in status, meaning that their, um, uh, their status didn't go all the way back to the early days of the Republic. That's really kind of what it meant to be a patrician, but they were 
uh, in every respect, noble and respect and uh, honored and, and all of that. Um, uh, Tiberius Gracchus the Elder, uh, meaning the father of the one we're talking about here, had married um, uh, a woman named Cornelia, um, who was from the Cornelii uh, peoples, um, and, and this she was actually the, um, uh, the daughter of Scipio Africanus, the conqueror of Hannibal, um, the great hero of the Second Punic War. And that act alone uh, would have, um, you know, meant honor for the, the family for generations. Um, and so Tiberius, there was a lot expected of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. Um, uh, you know, his relatives going back many generations had held high positions. He came into the world with great honor already. Um, and his mother, his father died when he was quite young. I think he was only four or five years old. Um, his mother Cornelia... However, with access to wealth, um, had raised him uh, in such a way as to go into politics, to be successful uh, as a Roman man. Um, you know, high, he was a highly educated individual, an extremely adept public speaker, um, and also trained for a career in the military. And uh, he had won some accolades for his exploits in uh, some of these campaigns in Spain. Um, However, there was a, there was kind of a setback in the in the year 137 BCE, when a Roman army um, under the command of a consul named Munis, Municius um, uh, was ambushed by um, a group of uh, well uh, Spaniards um, and uh, was surrounded um, and forced to surrender. And Tiberius Gracchus, because his name was known, uh, the these Spaniards um, asked that he be the one to negotiate the terms of surrender. Um, and he was serving as a quaestor at the time, um, and uh, had, was kind of a, uh, an assistant of Manichius uh, in the army. And so Tiberius Gracchus actually seems to have done a pretty good job at this. He managed to negotiate the withdrawal of all of the Roman troops while only giving up a couple of towns. This was really quite skillful diplomatically on his part because he was respected by uh, the, you know, by these uh, Spanish uh, uh, peoples who had um, defeated Municius. Um, but in the aftermath of this, when news got back to Rome, Tiberius Gracchus was in part blamed for the way that this had gone, even, even though he was not in command of the army. Um, uh, there was some idea um, that the negotiation, um, the terms of surrender, were not as favorable to the Romans as they could have been, even though that was really kind of ridiculous. Uh, leading this accusation was his own brother-in-law, Scipio Emilianus, um, who had also led armies in Spain and uh, was a you know fiercely ambitious man. Um, uh, he was uh, married to Tiberius Gracchus' sister Sempronia, um, and you know he turned against his brother-in-law uh, in this regard, and, and uh, this led to some uncertainty for Tiberius Gracchus. What looked like uh, a career destined for great things, easily destined for the consulship, was now thrown into some amount of disarray. Um, so Tiberius Gracchus, drawing upon his plebeian side, determined to go a slightly different route to power. Um, he decided to stand election for the tribunate. Now this was not an uncommon thing, but uh, this, you know, this tended to be a path to higher power for those of plebeian status who didn't quite have the heritage that Tiberius Gracchus did. Um, uh, given the families he came from, you know, uh, he would have been expected to skip the tribunate. Um, but he stood election for tribune. He was elected in the year 133. Um, and uh, as soon as he became tribune, he decided to really make a splash with this. Right Now, let's recall that tribunes have a sort of imperium, uh, not quite like the imperium of the um, consuls and the praetors in that they couldn't command armies and things like this. But they did have the power to um, issue some decrees, and more especially, they had the power to... Um, uh, propose laws before the Concilium Plebis. Um, and so, you know, they determined the agenda of the, what it was now the main lawmaking body in, in Rome, okay? 
And so he proposed a law, um, and he backed this with some very skillful speeches, at least according to Plutarch and others who write about him, um, that uh, took issue with the growth of Latifundia. Um, and to do this, he referred back to the Lycanian Law of 367 BCE, uh, which we discussed in the last lecture, um, which said that no single individual could hold more than 500 yugera of public land, uh, Tiberius Gracchus said, we are going to enforce this. Um, and uh, to make sure he didn't alienate senators, he did say that if you know the senatorial uh, holders of that property had made improvements to it, that they would be compensated for uh, what they paid out of pocket and everything. Um, uh, and so this was not actually too radical. Um, but all of the excess land was to be then distributed to plebeians um, in probably, there's some question in the sources about this, but probably about plots of about 30 acres, 50 yugera. Um, and, uh, you know, this was, this was met with wild approval among the plebeians, understandably. This was wildly popular in uh, the Concilium Plebis. Um, oh, and uh, one, one other aspect of this that he uh, noted, or rather that he added to this law, was uh, the provision that um, when the current occupant of the, f the 500 yugera of public land passed away or passed along their lands in inheritance to their heirs, that there would be a tax of half of that land, so 250 Yugara of the land would then be taken from the family, and this would also be redistributed. And this redistribution would be done by a commission made up of three men. Uh, that commission, by the way, ended up being Tiberius Gracchus, his brother Gaius, um, and his uh, father-in-law. Um, and so, you know, this wasn't exactly an unbiased uh, set of uh, commissioners um, in this regard. Well, this land redistribution plan um, was not popular, uh, suffice it to say, with the patricians, uh, particularly those who held massive latifundia. Um, the main opposition to this came from uh, the guy who had served as consul um, uh, previously, but, but at this point was the Pontifex Maximus. His name was Scipio Nasica Serapio, um, actually Cornelius Scipio Nasica Serapio. Uh, and uh, uh, let's get the names right, okay. Um, and also Scipio Emilianus, uh, the brother-in-law, the one who had kind of screwed him over at Numantia, um, he uh, also uh, came out in opposition to this. Um, and uh, there was a great deal of fighting. Um, uh, they tried to, uh, Scipio, uh, the Scipio Nasica, um, tried to uh, get another tribune to veto this. Um, when that tribune stood to express opposition, uh, supporters of Tiberius Gracchus um, kind of beat him up. And so we're, we have the introduction here of political violence to push things through. Um, and this led to the creation of the Land Commission. Um, and uh, Scipio Nasica and Scipio Emilianus then decided just to, to kind of wait until Tiberius Gracchus's year was up. Um, or actually, no, they, they, did, they determined upon a couple of things to... Uh, to oppose this, what was now a law. Uh, the first is the Senate would simply not fund it, right? I mean, this has to have funding uh, to get anything done. You gotta, you know, do surveys of land and things like this. This is gonna be pretty expensive. And so the Senate, um, led by the, you know, these, by Nausicaa and Emilianus, um, uh, simply said, we're not gonna do anything about this. We're not gonna agree to, to provide any money for this. And that, that was supposed to end it. Um, and then they were also waiting for Tiberius Gracchus's term of office to end, where he would no longer be sacred, uh, as the tribunes were, um, and uh, you know then they then they could get their political revenge, so to speak, maybe even violently. Um, um, but it was at this point uh, in the latter half of the year in which he was tribune, one thirty three, that Atlas the third of Pergamum died without an heir, and Pergamum had been for several generations an ally of Rome. Um, and Attilus, in his will, apparently left his entire fortune and the control of his kingdom to Rome. And given that he knew uh, 
the Gracchi family, he actually reached out to them, sent messengers to them with a part of the inheritance, a part of his personal wealth. Um, and so Tiber Tiberius Gracchus took possession of this and then in the Concilium Plebis said, I have the perfect solution for the land commission. Uh, we will use the money provided by Attalus III and his will to us uh, to fund this. This, again, was met with wild approval among the people. Um, this would mean they didn't need the Senate to grant them any money uh, for this. And uh, the senators who were in opposition really could do little about this. They were not happy uh, with that. But uh, Tiberius Gracchus was so popular at this point that it was difficult to oppose him. Then he took the extraordinary step of declaring that he was going to stand for re-election for the year 132. Now, this was um, uh, highly out of sorts with tradition. Um, it wasn't especially illegal because, again, Rome did not have a written constitution and everything was done by precedent and all of that. And so, you know, um, they could probably find a precedent somewhere in the distant Roman past for just about everything. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, there, there were uh, past precedents uh, for this too, I suppose, but it was just highly irregular. Um, and at this point, Scipio Nausicaa uh, uh, went to the Senate um, and, uh, you know, tried to oppose this. Um, uh, and it, the whole of Rome began to erupt in violence over this issue. Um, and uh, eventually supporters of Scipio Nausicaa um, broke into a meeting where Tiberius Gracchus was speaking um, and uh, there was chaos. Uh, in the chaos, a lot of the furniture was upset and became broken. And uh, these opponents of Tiberius Gracchus ended up picking up these like broken chair legs and things, adding them to the weapons they already brought with them. And uh, they beat Tiberius Gracchus to death um, with the furniture um, and ended up killing about 300 of his supporters at the same time. Okay. Now, um, Edward Watts points out, and I think that he's correct in saying this, that this is a key moment in Roman history, right? Um, though he does blame Tiberius Gracchus's um, attempts to sort of overturn tradition um, as the, the, ma the main thing at fault here, um, uh, you know, I mean, this is really the first time at least since the early days of the Republic, since the uh, conflict of the orders in the 5th and early 4th centuries BCE, where political agendas were being backed by violence. Now, Tiberius Gracchus had to some extent started this. Um, he, you know, his supporters had beaten up uh, the Tribune who tried to oppose his uh, land commission proposal. Um, but, uh, you know, Scipio Nausicaa and his supporters then took it a, a, a step, a major step further in killing several, uh, 300 of the supporters of Tiberius Gracchus, including Tiberius himself, right? Now, in the aftermath of this, uh, th this did not actually go well for Scipio Nausicaa, um, and he, um, ended up leaving the city a year or so after the assassination, um, he shortly after that died of uh, in in rather suspect circumstances. He probably was poisoned or assassinated in in some other way, um, uh, in revenge for what he had done to Tiberius Gracchus. Right? I mean, this is a powerful family. They have all sorts of um, uh, connections and all of that. Right? Uh, Scipio Aemilianus also lost popularity and never really recovered from this. Um, in the meantime, Rome's attention was taken uh, away by a revolt in Asia Minor. Um, even though Attalus had left uh, his kingdom to Rome and his will, uh, not all of the people of Pergamum were happy with this. There was an illegitimate son of Eumenes II, uh, the king previous to, uh, um, previous to Attalus III, uh, who claimed to be the legitimate king. Uh, he led an uprising. This guy's name was Aristonicus. Um, and he led an uprising, uh, and this drew a great deal of support. Um, he took over some towns. Uh, he declared his uh, the main town where he had support to be what was what he called the city of the sun, backed by the god of the sun, uh, and all of this. Um, 
And uh, Rome ended up having to send an army there. Um, this army uh, defeated Aristonicus. Um, and at this point, uh, they it, Pergamum ceased to be an independent kingdom <clears throat> and became a Roman province. Um, and this is, uh, the, you know, they called it simply Asia. Um, not to be confused with the continent of Asia, this is a Roman province here, right? Um, now, in part because of the, uh, the, the sordid nature of the way this whole debate over the land commission had ended up, um, uh, after the death of Tiberius Gracchus, most senators withdrew their objections from the land commission. Um, and it continued to operate. Um, and uh, the younger brother of Tiberius Gracchus, whose name was Gaius, um, he uh, sat at the, at the head of this thing, and uh, his reputation began to increase, even though he was still quite young at this point. Um, and he emerged in the aftermath of all of this as um, uh, the most active politician in Rome in the 120s. Um, now, um, to understand what happens with Gaius Gracchus, we have to first of all um, note one of the results of this land commission or this land redistribution plan. Um, all of the land redistribution, or the vast majority of it at least, was going to be given to actual Roman citizens. There were a lot of people still in Italy, many of whom had been Roman subjects and had even fought in Roman armies and things like this, uh, for many generations, even for many centuries, who did not have Roman citizenship. And I said, this is, you know, this is one of the thorniest issues um, that, uh, that Rome was facing at this point. Okay? Um, and uh, to make matters kind of worse for the Gracchi in the short term, um, as they were seeing to this land redistribution, um, their old enemy, the, you know, the brother-in-law, Scipio uh, Emilianus, in an attempt to resurrect his political career um, after the assassination of Tiberius Gracchus, um, he uh, sort of took up the cause of the Italians. Um, uh, he had clients among the Italians and, uh, you know, sort of set himself up as their champion. Um, he was due to give a speech on this uh, one day, and that morning he was found dead, probably murdered. Um, and this, you know, caused a bit of a scandal, and to try to cover that up and to distract anyone from probably investigating a little too closely, because the Gracchi may have been involved in that assassination, um, uh, Scip uh, Scipio Emilianus' own wife, Sempronia, the sister of Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, is thought to have probably been involved in this, right? So it's, you know, this is a pretty, this is a sordid affair. Um, Gaius Gracchus expressed support for the Italian cause, okay? Now, this, um, in a way, was a problem for him, okay? Because Gaius Gracchus, um, when he finally kind of came into his own, I think he was about 10 years or so younger than his brother Tiberius, or at least a few years younger, significantly younger. Uh, he was elected tribune exactly 10 years after his brother had been elected tribune. Um, and, and he won re-election in the following years. So this is 123, 122. Um, he was trying to not make some of the same mistakes that his brother had made um, in, you know... Uh, coming out too strongly on one single issue that would be really polarizing. Uh, Gaius Gracchus was a much shrewder political operator in many ways than Tiberius was. Um, but this, you know, he, in a sense, divided himself a little too much. Uh, and this is the thing that ended up getting him in trouble. Okay. So in order to appeal to, um, partly to the Italians, uh, um, it, well, well, we'll come to that, okay? Uh, mostly to the plebeians, mostly to the, the urban poor. He proposed new colonies. Now, this was not exactly favorable to the, uh, the equites or to the senators um, who made a lot of money, you know, uh, as, as publicans. Uh, this especially the equites, the senators didn't do that, but uh, the equites made a lot of money acting as publicans. Founding new colonies would take away some of the territory that um, 
uh, that allowed for that, right? And he proposed colonies in southern Italy, specifically around Tarentum, and also a little bit later in Carthage. And these were wildly popular among the plebeians, not so much among the nobles, okay? Um, in addition to that, in a naked appeal to uh, the urban poor, he proposed for the first time, and this is going to become a, a trend, actually, um, uh, that the state take over some of the distribution of grain. Um, you know, the, the urban poor, the, the rural poor, for that matter, were uh, in large parts um, beholden to the, the whims of the grain market uh, and to people who set prices for this. Uh, Gaius Grack has proposed that the state buy up excess grain and uh, sell it at a very low price to the, uh, the plebeians in Rome. This, of course, was very popular as well. Um, and then, you know, seeing that he was starting to draw the ire of some of the nobles, um, he also proposed auctioning off tax contracts to potential equites to, to serve as publicans in Asia, now that Rome had set up this province in Asia, right? And so he's trying to do some things to appeal to the plebeians. He's trying to do some things to appeal to the equites. Um, the thing that got him in trouble was he also tried to become the champion of the Italians. And he initially supposed, or proposed, I should say, granting citizenship to a larger number of Italians. And in doing this, he was outmaneuvered by a couple of other politicians who had been opposed to uh, the Gracchi family for a while. One of these was uh, Lucius Opimius, um, who had been praetor uh, and uh, was set to become consul in the year 131. Um, and so he had been maneuvering, to, tr or rather he had try been trying to outmaneuver um, Gaius Gracchus for a couple of years up to that point. The other was his ally, uh, Marcus Livius Drusus, um, who was tribune in the year 122 along with Gaius Gracchus. When Gaius uh, proposed this, you know, these extended, uh, or the, these further grants of citizenship to some of the Italians, Drusus vetoed that, but then Drusus actually made the uh, political move of um, kind of bidding him up. He proposed, then, uh, an even more generous grant of citizenship, knowing that um, Gaius Gracchus would not want to let him take credit for this. Um, he really didn't want this to happen, but this is, as I said, this is an effort to bid him up. Um, and Gaius Gracchus responded by saying that all Italians should receive citizenship. And this was a rather radical proposal. Now, why is this issue so um, serious and so thorny at this point? Well, one of the reasons, again, was that um, the... Uh, Italians had been left out of the land redistribution to a great extent, right? And the Gracchi had been unpopular among them as a result of this. And, and this is where Opimius and Drusus saw that they could exploit this weakness. And so when Gaius Gracchus tried to, you know, uh, move to the Italian cause, um, you know, they, they saw that they could, that, you know, they could seize the, uh, the agenda, so to speak, to the, to, by bidding him up to the point where he proposed something that was not going to fly, um, uh, certainly for the senators, but especially for the plebeians of Rome, uh, you know, who did not want to have to compete for things like land redistribution or even things like this new um, uh, cheaper grain distribution with more citizens, right? It was the poor who liked being citizens. They, they didn't want uh, more Italians to become citizens. Okay, and so Gaius Gracchus lost some support among the people who had been their strongest supporters up to that point, that is, the urban poor. Um, and for that reason, he uh, decided not to stand election as tribune in the year 121. Um, uh, and so that year, he um, uh, served only as a land commissioner. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the tensions were still high in Rome over this. Um, uh, Gaius Gracchus had many supporters, um, but there were detractors as well. 
uh, when some violence broke out between the supporters of Gaius Gracchus and others, um, Opimius, who was serving as consul, uh, managed to convince the Senate to give him the power, this is one of these uh, Senatus Consultum Ultimum decrees, give, them, give him the power to quell the violence in Rome. Um, and uh, once he had that, he organized uh, troops who attacked the supporters of Gaius Gracchus um, and uh, ended up killing not only um, Gaius Gracchus and, and several of his family members, but also about 3,000 of his supporters. Um, and so the violence is just escalating at this point, right? Um, and it looks like the Republic's about to collapse under its own weight, or rather um, with these changes. So we can see that these attempts at reform actually just make things worse. Um, in, with hindsight, if uh, Gaius Gracchus and Livius Drusus had managed somehow to uh, come to terms on the question of Italian citizenship, this probably would have staved off some of the terrible things that happened in the uh, subsequent decades. Because um, uh, we're going to see in the 90s, late 90s, there's this you know, war between the peoples of Italy and Rome that costs uh, tens of thousands of lives. Um, uh, you know, these, these issues that they're dealing with at this point um, were thought to be dire. Later on, these are not going to be issues. They simply couldn't find compromise to these things, and the issues sort of keep stepping up in, um, in their sensitivity um, and in the amount of violence that they provoke, right? So this is a harbinger of things to come. This is not a good situation that they're in. And even though things calm down in the intervening couple of decades, um, uh, many of the uh, wounds that were opened during this period were still pretty raw. All right. So um, last point here in this lecture. Um, what we're starting to see are a couple of different approaches in politics. Now, by the time of um, Cicero and, and uh, the first triumvirate, um, this is, you know, 60, 70 years on from the period we're talking about here, uh, there were actual names used for these, populares and optimates. Um, but we should not confuse um, or use, confuse these terms or use them inappropriately, okay? These are not political parties. These are at best, political camps or political approaches. Someone considered a popularis would um, use things like the office of tribune and measures undertaken in the Concilium Plebis to get business done in Rome. They also tended to appeal to the plebeians, and in particular to the poor plebeians, the urban poor, for their support. Optimates, on the other hand, uh, tended to be more traditional, uh, tended to um, try to work through the Senate and through the office of consul and to do things in a more traditional way, right, to uh, uh, exercise power in ways that were in keeping with uh, the precedents in Rome a little more. Um, it could be said that Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus are the first of the populares, um, and uh, figures like Opimius uh, are more of, you know, kind of the optimates um, brand, and Scipio uh, Aemilianus uh, as well, um, and, and uh, Nausicaa and, and these others who are their opponents. Um, but on the other hand, um, no politician in the late Republic, not Tiberius Gracchus, not Gaius Gracchus, not Opimius, uh, not Aemilianus, and not figures like Marius and Sulla and Caesar and Pompey and Crassus and Cicero, right? Um, none of these guys fit perfectly into either of these camps. There are times when uh, individual political figures will act more like a populatus, and in other cases they will act more like an optimus. Um, and so we shouldn't be too liberal in our usage of these things and assume that these are hard and fast identities. One of the things I've noticed in reading the Edward Watts Mortal Republic book is that he never uses these terms. Um, 
And so, you know, that I think is indicative of where the scholarship has gone in recent years about this. Um, but, you know, we can use these terms to some extent to try to make sense of the chaos uh, that comes, um, that we'll talk about in the next few lectures. So that's it for this one. 